a pretty hard group to follow. <laughs> now that this microphone's working, I think we'll run down and see the program all over from the top. <laughs> As part of your program, we are looking forward now to hearing from President Emmons. And I'm just as anxious as I know you are to take a look through the sheepskin curtain. Dr. Emmons? Members of the alumni group and emeritus and faculty members and all the people here at the head table. Actually, this look through the sheepskin curtain has been going on since this morning. It's an attempt on the part of our alumni office and the rest of us here at the campus to under his direction and supervision and urging and encouragement to see what we can do over a period of years, this one being the beginning, to say that graduates from Ball State Teachers College can very well afford to come back and have what we call a new adventure in adult education. And as I'm sure some of you know that this morning we heard Dr. Cooper talk about you and the extra terrestrial age, and this really was a shot out into outer space for the people who were there this morning. And then this afternoon, Dr. LaFollette talked about education, satellites, and freedom, and he did this uh, by making comparison between the kinds of things that he had seen in Europe and the kinds of educational programs with the many criticisms that we're getting here. And now tonight we're to have an additional uh, one of these uh, pushes out into outer space in terms of this uh, getting through the sheepskin curtain. Before we uh, present the speaker for this evening, I'd like to encourage you next year, those of you who are here in these anniversary classes and otherwise, to get back next year again to see what happens in our next adventure in the education for those of us who have completed our college program, our initial college program and who are not necessarily taking courses but are coming back to get caught up, the same as people do in many other avenues of endeavor. It's good to see the people who came for these classes back. This is always good for us. It's encouraging and helpful to us. There are some other people, I think, who don't belong in any one of the categories. Is it all right if I ask them to stand? Classes other than the four that were introduced, representatives of those classes. With the four... have a group of uh, faculty members, current faculty members on the campus. I'd like to have them stand also, and their wives, you know, there's some up here at the head table. Here. <laughs> Carl came in then when we were standing up, this gave him a chance to get back to the rest of us. In some places, it falls upon the president to tell people how wonderful it is to be at a particular place, like Ball State Teachers College. Then he has to try to make up stories about how all the people who graduated to support the institution, and how all of the people who have been members of the faculty continue to support the college. Well, much better than any stories I can tell is to have the people actually come. And this is one of the wonderful things about working here at Ball State. We have some representatives from our emeritus group who have come to be with us tomorrow night for the after the commencement dinner, but some of them came in and are here tonight. This is exceptionally good. For instance, here is Francis Bosford, who came all the way from California to be with us. Will you stand, Miss Bosford? Now, we have a group of people who periodically show up here on the college campus, and they're here in force again tonight, and I'm going to introduce the group of them and ask them all to stand. Ms. DeHorty, Ms. Beeman, Mrs. DeMott, Ms. Knott, come on, all of you stand up and we get you called. I think I saw Harry Holly come in. Mrs. Hunt is here. Mrs. Graham is here. Now, is there anyone that I didn't see who is an emeritus member of the group that should be standing up? Do I see someone else? I mentioned Miss Beeman, didn't I? Yes, yes. Who, who is there else that I didn't see? 
Now, with the new folks in the emeritus group to be standing up are the Paul Williams and Grace Bryant. They're going to be emeritus after tomorrow. I'm Mrs. Williams. And the Neuer should stand up, too, you see. Now, what about a hand with this? Just, it's, it's wonderful not to have to make up stories about the fact that these people continue to support the program. Uh, tomorrow night, there will be a, they will be here, these people are here tonight, and an additional group of people from the alumnus group, from the emeritus group. Now, Dr. Linson and the people who have arranged this program have arranged a real treat for us for the balance of the evening. Uh, Dean Neuer. Now, most of you people need no introduction to Dean Neuer. Um, I think perhaps it's uh, easiest uh, for me to describe the kinds of things that go on by reporting what went on one day when we had an administrative heads meeting and we were sitting around and certain kinds of things came up. This illustrates, it seems to me, how what a remarkable and unique manner uh, Dean Neuer uses the, the words in the English language. He even coins new ones sometimes, you know, new phrases, and he gets a new twist for them. And this day we had decided several things, and about three of them, it ended up that the president was going to have to do something about something or other. And the last one that came up was the fourth one, and the dean said, this just shows that the president is the receiver of the ultimate buck. <laughs> now, for some of you, this, the only difference is that this evening, the dean is the receiver of the ultimate buck. He's going to talk with us this evening about are we intellectual sleepwalkers? Now this is another projection behind the sheepskin curtain. And it's a very real pleasure for me to present to you a, a man who needs no presentation. Ralph Neuer. Mr. President, sir. Members of the Alumni Association and the near alumni, members of the faculty, ladies and gentlemen, I recall speaking before this group several years ago on the occasion of my retirement, at which time I spoke on to the topic, what every teacher knows but dare not tell. And I was sure that that would finish once and for all all my contact with the Alumni Association. <laughs> but you have invited me to return anticlimactically to uh, put in some punctuation marks to your today's deliberation and to give an expression to your high resolve to continue a vigorous intellectual life and a new expression of loyalty to your alma mater. But I wonder if you know that the words alma mater and alumnus have a, an etymological root in common. The root is A-L. In the word alma, the word means nourishing as well as kindly. And in the word alumnus, it means nourishing too and sustaining. So here we have a two-way relationship, reciprocal relationship, with mutual obligations working both ways in the deepest academic tradition. And as the alma mater nourishes its foster children, so in turn the foster children must furnish something of a basic inspiration by which the traditions of the alma mater are to be continued and handed down. Some time ago, as a dinner guest, of a newly elected president of another college in this state, the president's wife turned to me and asked, does Ball State have many wealthy alumni? Now, how would you have answered that? 
And I have often wondered since how I should have been successful. <laughs> the dollar contributions, of course, of the alumni are vitally important. But we're speaking here tonight of another kind of contribution, uh, that of keeping intellectually awake and alive. Uh, an attitude of uh, an attitude toward learning and of the things of the mind. Now this is especially crucial in the second half of the 20th century, which is marked at the moment by a marked anti-intellectualism. Item, we who are uh, perhaps a little more than literate, are called eggheads. And we're uh, regarded as content and uh, uh, not very reliable. We're theoreticians, swept aside to the busy everyday life. General public wants shortcuts, a quick education, wants to rely on digest and comics. In every college I have worked in, and they are several, and that includes Ball State Teachers College, the comic section of the paper is more religiously read than the editorial page. There are no exceptions in the United States, I am convinced. But the there is low-grade uh, time-wasting amusement with a growing insensitivity to uh, human suffering, violence, and uh, uh, injustice. The degradation of popular literature, which is particularly pornographic at this time. It's more like an explosion in the sewer. <laughs> The general substitution on television programs of quiz and uh, stunt information uh, knowledge, which leads to no understanding, general pride in mediocrity. It is said that if a competent, uh, a volume of competent verse, not the glittering nonsense of Ezra Pound, or the jingles of uh, any guest. Leave a lump in the throat and nothing in the head. <laughs> but a volume of competent verse can expect no popular uh, applause. It's like dropping the rose petals down the Grand Canyon and listening for the echo. <laughs> no, the second half of the century is marked pretty generally by uh, anti-intellectualism. And that's the background against which an elite, an intellectual elite of college graduates must operate in our culture. And you are the intellectual elite, or if college graduates are not that, what in heaven's name are they? So there is an increasing obligation on the part of those of you who are admitted to graduation <coughs> in the time-honored ceremony and admitted to the company of educated persons to uphold the tradition. But we've had to recognize, of course, and I speak now for members of the faculty, <coughs> that not even 40 or 50 uh, courses will not guarantee an education, nor three, an intellectual interest. It takes something more than that, a theme which I wish to develop. So a college graduate belongs to the intellectual elite and must carry an increasing obligation in view of the fact that he has been admitted to the company of educated people. What constitutes the some responsibilities of the generally educated? Now I suggest five. The first one is a recognition of the fact that the larger the circle of knowledge grows, the greater the surface of contact with the unknown beyond. 
In other words, you seniors graduating tomorrow will find that the more you learn, the more the race to learn, if you haven't already found it out. And second, the reckoning to realization of the vast difference, the vast distances that mankind must travel to progress one inch. The road to knowledge, responsible knowledge, is long, hard, and steep with all these things. And third, there must be a recognition of the acceleration of advance, not necessarily progress, but the acceleration, what fundamental principles are grasped. May I develop that point? Recent advances in mathematics and science were no surprise in their address on this campus the 5th of June, a year ago. What happened in October was definitely predicted. That did not call for prophecy. All you needed to do was to read the New York Times on the 2nd of July, on the 2nd of July, in an obscure place, and there it was for all to see. We've been building up to it for two decades. Are you aware of the fact that if a, the best MD in Muslim went to sleep in 1940, like Rip Van Winkle, and awakened today, he would be helpless in the practice of medicine in Ball Memorial Hospital. The rapid advance, once the fundamental principles have been grasped, it's amazing what has been happening. And force must be understood. The unexpected significance of abstruse and obscure things. The general public brushes aside all of this uh, research. Let me tell you something. Well, a hundred years ago, Clark Maxwell, a mathematical physicist of Cambridge, England, a Scotsman, wrote a treatise on electromagnetism, which was so difficult to read that only one or two people in the whole civilized world could understand it. A generation later, Hertz, a German physicist, got hold of it and figured out what he meant. Another generation passed the which is responsible for the fact that some of you are alive today. In other words, a bit of a pure reason on the part of a very remote scholar. A bit of reasoning that was placed in the libraries and forgotten, was dug up. But we have a way of saying, oh, well, that amounts to nothing. What good could that do? This thesis on the antennae of the Paleozoic cockroach. What good is that? You never can tell. <laughs> <laughs> to the average layman, the research worker is much like a busy mouse in a wastebasket. And fifth, the emergence of newer methods of investigation. The late Woodrow Wilson wrote a doctor's thesis at Johns Hopkins University. And he wrote it on congressional government. Now, you know doctor's theses, for the most part, of the transferring of bones from one graveyard to another. <laughs> but that was a pretty good thesis about congressional government. But in that entire investigation, he never took the 35-mile trip down to Washington to see it, Congress in action. Now, he couldn't get by with that in Ball State Teachers College, <laughs> nor in any other institution of learning that I know. But back in 1880, that was acceptable. Now, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to show you that what, we, what was acceptable 50 years ago, per se today, and we have to adjust our intellectual life to it. 
Now all this comes to me that it is a matter of getting educated as it is of keeping educated. How well indeed I remember back in Nebraska Wesleyan University some 35 years ago and I had a small park there at graduation time. A lad just took his diploma and went out shouting, gosh, I'm educated. Happens before your name, Mr. <laughs> well, that happens today only to the stupid. <laughs> the bachelor's degree, therefore, is only a license to continue learning. And if your education has stopped at a, any point of graduation, it might just as well never have begun. Now, this is not to be interpreted, ladies and gentlemen, as a mere book exercise. Books are only one means toward the attainment of wisdom and of understanding. The good book says of the making of books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. How true, the seniors will say. Quite recently, Chancellor Hudson of the University of Chicago and his man Friday, Mortimer Adler, I worked up as the great book. And in the great book, 102 ideas, all beautifully digested. Quite a thing. Before that, there was the five, the, the five foot bookshelf. And before that, going back as far as Aristotle, the dream of an encyclopedic knowledge existed. Francis Bacon had it, Voltaire had it, General had it. But these are all means to an end. are good to Abraham Lincoln because they tell me what I want to know. But suppose you don't want to know, and you can find your information some other place. But they will do this. And let me tell you, for I've grown gray and almost blind in trying to find it out. They enable you to distinguish the shadow from the sun. You remember Plato, in, who's more of a poet than a philosopher, in his book seven, told about the allegory of the cave. Now, I'm not going to translate that here to you tonight, so you will have other things to do before morning. But <laughs> here's the story. He tells about people who are chained, facing the darkness of the cave with the light behind them. Their heads are so changed they cannot move to see one side or the other. Their legs are chained. They cannot turn, and the whole world from childhood must be viewed in shadow. And across the scene there passes the figures of men and beasts, and all they can see is the shadow. The shadow not only of those things, objects before them, but the shadow of their companions. Now, that is the danger of substituting the shadow for reality, and books help you to distinguish between the two. The obligation then is to keep mentally alert and to avoid intellectual somnambulism, and it rests with peculiar in a peculiar weight upon teachers' college graduates. And now I'm going to say some things which may seem at first unkind. They are not so intense. This is true because those who teach must never cease to learn. We must not ask children to drink at a stagnant pool. Traditionally accepted patterns of our uh, craft since the beginning of this century have been atomistic and fragmented. In other words, a little bit here and a little bit there and everywhere a little bit. All added up would produce a person educated in our craft. Furthermore, they've been opportunistic. It's but a catch as catch can matter. Pick up a few credits here, work a factory shift, and go on. Now, all of these disadvantages have had advantages, but the disadvantages have been real and serious. The result has been the 
structure of our knowledge is usually like logical sequence. Great gaps, huge gaps have existed. And no perceived relationships have been available, have been clear. Now, if you can do something about this, and some of you older graduates who have gone gray in it, I know understand what I mean. You can fill those gaps during the rest of your days if you are intellectually alert. And these masses of facts that have been presented to you in the classroom can be thought through in terms of interrelationships and have a significance which will entitle you eventually to the claim of an educated person. Furthermore, teachers have suffered unlike physicians and nurses and from the fact that they are birds of past. I recall here in this very institution finding persons who had been to many institutions of learning, picking up credits here, credits there, and finally expecting them all to be added up as certified as a complete whole. You don't do that in medicine and you don't do it in nursing. And there's a good reason. And maybe we shouldn't do it. But that is one of the difficulties that we have in our craft. But now may I, may I pr pr proceed? I'm not unkindly to say that we have a peculiar problem here in eastern Indiana and in Ball State Teaching Center. I say we, and may I, Mr. President, sir, include myself and use the first person plural. Thank you. <laughs> in eastern Indiana, we have a dangerously conservative provincialism. That's what Middletown meant. Read it and see. The condition was somewhat mitigated in the, in the Middletown in translation, but it is not completely done yet. That's a part of our trouble. Second place, we have a home and mother complex. Now, what do I mean by that? Many a time I have talked with mothers of our students, and possibly some of you, when you needed a little encouragement of, from the dean's office to improve your uh, uh, points and hours. <laughs> I've talked with some mothers, and they say, well, now, he comes home every weekend, and that's the way I want it. Well, I think he should stay and work that work, get that work out. But don't you believe she would say to me that home is the best place for a boy? Now, it's hard to say anything to that. But quite recently, I had an experience with an institution that keeps all of its students on the campus from the beginning of a semester to the end. And there's a difference. And we could do with more of that here. That's one of our difficulties. It has advantages. I'm pointing out the disadvantage. And then the adding machines come concept that it means that if we add up a column of credit, that that will ipso facto automatically produce a great an educated person. Well, if we know where the trouble is and understand it, we can do something about it, and we have one half the battle. Now, the alumni of any college, therefore, must recognize that dead trees filled with cement are not symbolic of the glory of the light and mind. It was recognized that in the second half of the 20th century, permanent cerebral vacations are out and forever out. They must recognize that the intellectual somnambulist can't fulfill the obligations of an elite, of a responsible elite. The slogan must be man's right to knowledge all the time and the freedom of the cube. But why, I turn to this, why, after the degree is conferred, why should one cudgel one's brain? or using the current term on this campus, break any, uh, break any book. Well, I'll tell you, you didn't get all this education just to die smart. <laughs> Said in a more dignified way from Shakespeare, oh, then we bring forth weeds 
when our quick minds lie still. But certainly to understand, to understand something of the meaning of events, to sense the tendency, to feel the groundswell of an awakening of the awakening of human aspiration. That is a challenge worthy of, of an intelligence. What, for example, is the deeper meaning beneath the tragic events transpiring in France? Shall we switch off the lights and shoot it out in the dark? And that's almost what has happened within the last two or three days in France. Wasn't it Karl Marx who said, behind the door the executioner waits? Nemesis grins and fingers are scourged. What do things like that mean in the second half of the century? The intellectual elite should understand the significance of that way. Or in the field of science, we have pushed our frontiers far, far, far into space. So we have identified a spot 500 billion light years off on the edge. But we have just begun to try to understand and control the mysterious forces of the living cell, which, when uncontrolled, contain the seeds of cancerous malignancy. We must understand, else wherefore war. Now as a university regards the universe within whose infinity have emerged order, life, and man, so the college, this college, your college, must regard the future whose complexity increases the geometric ratio, out of which must evolve an intelligence able to feel the deepest aspiration of the social order of which you are a chosen and creative part. But we are young. We are absurdly young. The nearest institution of higher learning, Anderson College, claims to be a year older. Not to mention the venerable seats of learning in England and Europe, which are almost a thousand years old. There is Harvard, 322 years old. Yale, 64 years younger. Princeton, 46 years younger than Yale. Time moved slowly in those days. But a week from next Tuesday, the 17th of this month, Ball State will start his 40th year. Looking back to the days when 23 staff members, counting everybody, and some 200 students that were quite uncertain of whether they could care to stick or not, assembled to the beginning. Now the tradition of sub substantial learning and respect for it, a, sub a tradition of vigorous intellectual life is like a most, is like a plant, most delicate and slowly maturing. Its roots must be deep, and the sunshine of encouragement must ever be at It must be sustained, sustained and nourished by you, alumni. These lines I would dedicate then to your alma mater. Fair flower of knowledge tree, set delicately mid campus green, your pleasant hue softened for the years. Loving mother, exulting in her children's joy and loyalty. Giving, yet asking little in return. Happy in sure knowledge on her part. Epitome of charm and dignity. 
Hall State alumni, never, never, never take your alma mater for granted. For there are those who have broke their hearts that the spirit of learning here might endure.